It's very, very nice to be here in San Francisco where I keep my heart, as the old, the old song has it. And um, I have to say that this show that's on right now uh, demonstrates more than I could possibly imagine the extraordinary potential of the book as art, focusing on one, not just one title, but one genre of books by the same author. I grew up three miles from Darsbury, by the way, which is where Charles Dodgson was born and raised, and uh, with the wonderful stained glass windows in the, the Alice in Wonderland in stained glass in the church there. And um, I want to draw your particular attention, to, because of course I'm a bookbinder, to the two extraordinary bindings by Eleanor Ramsey. Is she here? No. And um, also one by Jill Tarlow, who are often off these shores as well. They are, uh, uh, the work is absolutely amazing. Shall we have the lights down? Thank you, Lesha. Um, so it's nice to be back. <clears throat> I think this is my fourth time speaking here. And in previous times, I've talked um, about my work and also about the Titanic, which is not about my work. And tonight I'm going to talk not so much about my work, although there's a little bit of it has crept in. I couldn't avoid that. But for a long time now, I've been interested in the book as art. I'm not really a book artist, although I dabble. I don't have a large budget, so I can't collect extensively. So what I collect are things I can afford. And what it turns out I can afford is enormous, because there's so much wonderful work being done by young book artists, students, and so on, which is extremely experimental, very beautiful, and stunning. I'll be getting to that a bit later. But first, we have to pose this question, which is, why do books move, other than in the traditional codex form of turning one page after another? Well, of course, historically, they move for reasons of function, and later they move for reasons of fun. I'm going to show you some historical, some contemporary artists, and because it shouldn't be overlooked, some commercially produced books. And as I said, a little bit of my own work. So you could take this story in one of numerous ways. The story I'm telling you isn't the correct authorized story of the history of movable books. It's my story. You could tell your own story, and you may even argue with many of the things I'm going to tell you. But they're not facts. And why let facts get in the way of a good story? Anyway. <laughs> so we begin. In the early 13th century, in St. Albans in England, and this man, rather jokely depicted here, and he's a Benedictine monk, and his name is Matthew Paris. So he was the Abbey's historian, and he wrote chronicles or observations of the world around him. His best-known work is one of the most famous British books, the Chronica Majora, which is in the British Library. But his innovation in paper movables came with another kind of text. Several books in the library contained circular tables which were used to calculate dates in the church year, such as Easter and other holy days that were not fixed. By comparing the columns within the circular tables, the monks were able to coordinate the proper dates for the religious observance. But, of course, a lot of the books were heavy and cumbersome to handle, let alone rotate for the purposes of calculation. So Paris, realizing that it would be easier if the table itself rotated, drew the table on a separate piece of vellum and attached it to the center of the page with a little bit of string, thus, at a stroke, solving the problem of ecclesiastical event planning and <laughs> inventing the first movable book. Now this, <clears throat> of course, is not the book. That's a, that's a facsimile. And some of you will remember this, because the first few slides are from this book. About, um, I don't know, Mary Austin may know, about uh, 12 years ago or so, there was a wonderful exhibition of pop-ups at the San Francisco Centre for the Book. And in it, there was this book offered for sale, and it's the wonderful book that is the 10th anniversary of the Movable Book Society's book. About a dozen years ago, would you say, Mary? And they were selling it for $50. It was incredible, so we bought two. That's the rule when you buy pop-ups, if you collect them as I do. Always buy two. The kids can play with one, you keep the other, because the one rule of movable books is 
Don't let children anywhere near them. <laughs> this book is called Harlequin's Invasion, and it's what's known as a turn-up book. So we're skipping forward several centuries here. This was the first printed movable book by Robert Sayer, an English artist from 1725 to 1794. And he was a printer in Fleet Street, where, of course, all of our printing happened, which uh, specialised in children's books. Now, since the late 1600s, these books have been handmade objects made by folding a page into an accordion with two flaps that hinged up or down. It's pretty straightforward. Pictures on the outside were lifted to remove a changed picture on the inside and were all were known as turn-up or sometimes metamorphosis books. And they were the first movable books aimed at young readers and his most popular series was this one which featured the popular figure Harlequin, the well-known pantomime character. He published 15 Harlequinade titles in the 1770s alone. Now this is a cute one. This is Little Red Riding Hood, of course, and this is an example of what's called the scenic book. All these book structures by this time were, were acquiring names. And there were patents, of course, and all this kind of stuff. This is by Dean and Son, very famous. They're still going today. Uh, English publishers thriving in this field between 1850 and 1900. So they defined the movable book as it is known today, creating over 60 titles in their time. Their scenic movables were inspired by the 18th century toy theatres, of which more later. Their scenes rise from the page when a rib ribbon is pulled. So in this one, there's a little gimlet. And you can just see a little bit of red there. That's the ribbon. So you pull it from the back. So it lies flat, and you have to pull it up. So it hasn't quite achieved the apotheosis that we, uh, we're waiting for yet, but we're getting there. And there's, uh, there's just two layers here. It's, it's uh, one panel and another panel. This is one of their first, as I said, Little Red Riding Hood, 1857, which were printed and then hand-coloured. By the late 1880s, the market for movables had become very competitive, and they branched out into cheaper books and were pioneers of chromolithography as a more economical alternative to hand-colouring. In the 1980s, they became part of the Hamlin Group, and it's, that's the company that we know as kids. We go and buy Hamlin toys. This is a beautiful book called Aus dem Leben, and this is by the guy who I think is the grandfather of the movable book. His name is Lothar Megendorfer. Um, he's a German paper engineer, 1847 to 1925. When you start to talk to people who collect these things, Megendorfer is the big goal. If there were a Roxburgh club for movable collectors, this would be the one they had to have to complete their collection. Um, anything by Megendorfer. But they're old and they're valuable. So he started out as an illustrator and humor writer and later became known for his ingenious movables, of which this is one, which use this new thing, tabs and joints. This is what he invented. They have hidden pivoting tabs and multiple joints held together with metal rivets and wires. And he was one of the first creators of a movable book that can really be called a paper engineer. And this is so simple, and this is probably the mechanism that we would have on all the pop-ups we had. Uh, not pop-ups, but movables we had as children. See, we mustn't use the word pop-up. That's only one thing. Movable is... So you pull this, and this what happens. And they're all very, very simple. And you see what's happening. Two things are moving. And the great thing about this book, the 10th anniversary of the Movable Book Society book, is the mechanisms. You know, these pages are quite fat because uh, they've got all the sort of workings. And the, the pages of this celebration book were not fixed down. So you can see all the tabs... And that's his original handwriting, so they went to all the trouble of reproducing those in facsimile. And the only thing they've done differently is the rivets are made of plastic, not metal, so that they won't rust. Maybe the plastic will break down, but that's not our concern. Anyway, this is a sweet book, and this is called Come and Go, a novel book for children, from 1900, from Panorama Pictures. Ernest Nister, he's the other great name in movables, a German uh, artist from 1842 to 1909. He started out as a lithographic printer in Oberlinken, a place, a town known for its high-quality colour work. Then he opened a workshop in London, and in 1890 produced his first panorama book. These are extremely rare now. I don't own one. Um, there's a very good bookshop in England 
called uh, Stella Books that specialize in movable books, and they send me their catalog every month. And there's always a nister in there, and it's always about £4,000 more than I can afford. It's about £4,100. <laughs> But this ingenious mechanism allows for two contrasting images to move from side to side with this clever switch inside the page, which creates, creating the first books of its kind with movable scenes. So, uh, little Bo Peep once lost a sheep and searched in vain around, but pull the string and then you'll see how one of them she found. So you pull the string one way, oh, a big pardon, you pull the string one way and she disappears, and then you pull the other string back the other way and she comes back. And, of course, it's two different things. And one just falls out, and then the other one comes back. It's that simple. This is one of my personal favorites, the pop-up Pinocchio. Now, this was the first official pop-up. It's the first book that was called Pop-Up by Harold Lentz. We're in America now, active in the 1930s. He was the proprietor of Blue Ribbon Books, and he coined and trademarked the term pop-up. He made affordable books during the Depression, and he collaborated also with Disney on uh, Mickey Mouse books. And recently, at a lecture I was doing, a guy came with the original of this that he had as a child. It was great to see it um, in great working order. Of course, I should also mention that as a conservator, there's a great deal of money to be made from repairing pop-up books, because <laughs> they're all totally destroyed. This is super. This is the animated circus book, and this is an example of the pull tab mechanism, which is slightly different. Uh, Julian Ware, another American, 1898 to 1970, also a lithographer, a woodcut artist, and later he made advertising store displays which incorporated movable components, which is wonderful. And I was recently in Vienna where they had the same thing. They had shop fronts with uh, basically movable book type things um, that were all being operated by a motor. Like these things writ large. Let's have a look at this. So I think there's uh, three different things move here. Yeah. His books were produced in the 1940s and owed their success partly to the lack of availability of traditional children's toys due to the shortage of tin, steel, and other materials because of the war effort. This is amazing. Now the Czechs enter the scene. These are the people who really put it on the map, the Czechs and the Polish. This is um, how Columbus discovered America, slightly contentious. Um, th this is the birth of the, the, of the very large pop-up. This is where we start to get into familiar territory. Uh, the artist is called Wojciech Kubasta. Now what's really interesting is when you buy these, and you can buy these, of course, I said, uh, they're quite expensive, you almost never see the name of the artist or the paper engineer on the book. So the only reason I know the names of these people is because people who wrote this book and the people at Stella Books who know their onions uh, will tell you who did it. The, the Nista books never say Nista on them. It's amazing. It's just the name of the writer and the publisher. But it's, we need to know the name of these people. Kubasta created some of the biggest and boldest pop-ups ever. And the Czechs came to dominate the field ever since the Second World War. He was originally inspired by seeing the Mickey Mouse pop-ups that I mentioned earlier and later himself got to work for Disney in the 70s, producing pop-up tie-ins for several Disney films. His books sold over 10 million copies worldwide. The thing to remember about pop-ups now is that whatever you do with a pop-up, everything has to hinge along the fold. So, I mean, they, these things can have folds within there, but everything ultimately has to hinge uh, down this way like this. So we were very fortunate about uh, 15 years ago to go to um, Santa Monica to, what was it called? Uh, something international, I can't remember now. Was it called Graphics International, Michael? Where 90% of the world's pop-ups were once made. And the proprietor is called Waldo Hunt. Some of you may know him, as in Where's Waldo? And he was the inventor of this factory that made all these pop-ups. And there was a young man there called Reeves who, it's a long story, I won't bore you with it, but he got a job there because he had this rare talent. And he was very young, and he decided that he was going to revolutionize the way pop-ups were designed and executed because it was so labor-intensive. All the paper engineers were Mexican. They brought with them this skill they have with, with paperwork. And they would laboriously 
cut and fold and, and cut and fold and all this stuff. And he wanted to create a computer program that would make it easier. And he failed miserably. <laughs> so he went into the shop and he said to one of these guys, OK, tell me how you do it. He said, first we make the design, then we cut it out, we stick it down, and then we smash it. <laughs> and wherever you smash it, the folds appear exactly where they need to be. So that's a really good story about how you work out your system. <clears throat> Now we move on, because these things are affordable. This is Robert Sabuda, the, one of the greatest pop-up artists working today. I'm sure many of you know him. I bought this in Salt Lake City 14 years ago for $25. It's now worth $250, uh, because it's still in its packet. <laughs> I love this. And this, of course, opens, and that's the tunnel, and that's a tunnel book. And that's the last page, which is extraordinary. This is David Carter, who's British, and he's taken the sort of frou-frou-ness out of pop-ups, and he's reduced it all to its elements. You know, one of the things that Reeves told us in Los Angeles is there are four or five names for, for pop-ups. There's mouth, there's bulge, I can't remember the others, but there's these, you know, there's these elements. There are people here who know more about this than I do because they actually make them. But David Carter sort of works with this principle, and his books are amazing. He's done about six so far. And this is great. It's, it's, in each one of these things, there's a red dot hidden. So this says, one perplexing puzzle box and one red dot. And it's buried in there, and you, have to, you can see it through there. Um, six fluttering flicker crickets and one red dot. What's nice about this is that the, uh, the, 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 the saw things are a little bit too small for the slot, so that when they come out, they make a noise. So this actually makes a rattling noise when you open the book, which is stunning, really. <clears throat> and this is um, the ABC 3D by Marion Bataille, American, 2008. It's a sort of holographic, a holographic cover. Holographic. And she just does, she explores the box. Box, mouth, bulge. I'll think of the other one in a minute. I wish I could show you the whole alphabet. But this is a good time to tell you what happened when I taught my niece's class. This is the V and the W. Um, I went to teach my nie niece's class. She's seven. I've never taught children before, and I never want to do it again. <laughs> they all sat in a circle, and we we're doing the Victorians. And I said, what do you know about the Victorians? And one little girl said, they're dead. I said, that's quite true. And then I said, I, I got up my Robert Sabuda Christmas uh, alphabet. So A is for angel, B is for baby, C is for cake. I don't know, went through. And we got to J. And I thought, well, this is an American book, so it's not going to be overtly religious. Uh, it's just a Christmas book, you know. And I couldn't remember what J was, and I'm about to turn the page, and one little girl goes, Jesus. And then the little boy goes, Jesus. And pretty much soon they're all chanting, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> And the teachers were all sitting there, and I said, I didn't realize I'd come to a revival meeting. <laughs> it was really frightening. Anyway, it was, uh, it was Jingle. <laughs> of course. Now we go back to the 30s through to the 50s. They can come from the, the Werner Lorry, very famous British publishers, the Werner Lorry show books. These are great. They sold for about five shillings, and on the back it said, All you need is a pair of scissors and some glue. That's an absolute lie, I can tell you. <laughs> because these things, are incredible. they come in a, in a kit and you've got to assemble them. They did about 50 titles. This is the Noah's Ark one, I think. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, let's say it's Noah's Ark. And um, see, five shillings. <clears throat> this is from the early 50s. And I bought this in a shop um, that had loads of them in the back, most of them um, in very poor condition. So I bought it and repaired it. You know, it's great. And talking of tunnel books, <coughs> in 97 or 98, one of the most famous American book artists, who sadly is not in the show because I can't include everyone, uh, Carol Barton, came here to teach a class, which I organized for the Handbook Binds of California. And I sat in the class and dutifully did my thing and then put it away and never finished it. And then about 10 years ago, I thought, I've got to finish this thing. So I did. And this is it. And it's called A Day to Bookbinders. And it's, and it's on, currently on exhibition at the Handbook Binds of California at the Bookbinders Museum. Because it's a, these peep shows, these tunnel books, whatever, long ago in the 18th century, people would carry them round in big boxes like sedan chairs from village to village, and you'd get to peep inside them. So that's the cover. That's going to be the lid. 
that's going to be the base. Now that's the book. And you would pay a penny to look inside and you'd see either the ruins of Carthage or a lady's ankle, uh, <laughs> depending on whether they were doing education or dirt, you know. <laughs> and they were hugely popular. And then, of course, they gave rise to the, theaters, the, the children's theater, toy theatres. And the most famous one that Carol showed us was the tunnel under the Thames. They ran out of money building the first Thames tunnel, so they produced this double peep show tunnel book with a viewing hole above to see the skyline and a viewing hole below to see the tunnel halfway dug because they were trying to raise money to finish it. That's a very rare book. Anyway, this is my tunnel. And this is a, it's, it is made from every famous image that we know as bookbinders, all collaged together. And this is the um, brand new steam operated bindery at, at Harper's. So that's, it's a concertina. And then the lid goes on. So this is, opaque plexi that lets light in, but also there are little windows cut in here which, which lets raking light in to create a bit of atmosphere. And then you, the, the, whole, the whole, it's all about perspective, it's all about scale, and it's all about the, the aperture being not too small but not too big. And then you look inside, so here's a lady sewing books, here's a man with a finishing wheel putting some gold on some books, this lady here is uh, folding sections I believe, this man is operating the standing press and right at the back there's a man in a frock coat and he's serving a customer who you can just make out is buying Jane Austen's latest set of uh, novels Aww. or so we'd like to believe <laughs> and this is an edition of 25 and I brought one with me because there's a book I'm going to show you later which I covet and can't afford and so the artist who made it and I have exchanged so I've made my 12th one of these that's 12 in 10 years. They are flying off the shelves. I can hardly keep up with demand. <laughs> and it's hand colored. And this is actually the original, which is done with pencil. But since then, I had a friend from LA come to stay who was a trompe l'oeil artist. And she said, put me to work. And I said, you can scrape some spines. She said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I said, oh, all right. Well, what can you teach me? And she said, painting. So she's taught me. So the new one is very, very vivid because she's taught me how to, to colour wash the whole thing, you know. And I've got a little formula how to do it. Anyway, that's the tunnel book. Now, talking of um, Victorian or otherwise curiosities, <clears throat> this book I acquired um, in a roundabout way. I restored it for the um, customer along with five other books. And the value of this book was roughly equivalent to the cost of the job. And he asked me if he'd like to trade. And I foolishly said yes but I'm glad I did, because it's very rare. The book itself is not important, it's George Herbert's poems, but what's important is what's underneath. So this is a gilded edge, and it's also gophered, which is incidental, but it's nice. But when you fan it out, that's what you see. And some of you will remember when Martin Frost, the world's most famous and one might almost say only well-known forage painter from England came and taught a workshop, one of the very first workshops, I think, at the centre, which we all took. It's absolutely beautiful because that's actually Burford Parish Church in Oxfordshire, which is the home of David Cameron, but don't let that scare you too much. <laughs> it's a cute little church. And the skill here is not the, really the artist. Any competent artist can paint a scene. The skill is in the gilder. Because you fan the book out, you do your painting, and then you give it to the gilder who puts the gold on. But when you put gold on a book edge, you first of all have to scrape it smooth. Now, if I, I can gild, but I don't do it very often because it takes me hours as opposed to minutes. But if I gilded my edge, I would almost certainly scrape the painting away. So the, the, the trick is to fan the pages out so that when you do the painting, slightly elongated so that when you scrape the pages, and you've removed a little bit, it, it matches. That's incredible. It was invented by Edwards of Halifax in the 18th century. They were in Yorkshire, but they had a showroom in London. And this is one of their famous ones. There's a book about it called Forage Painting. And that's Dover Castle. And that's somewhere in Middle Europa. Don't know where, but he could be Spanish or Dutch. I don't know. But it's beautiful. And Martin Frost, look at his website. He does double ones, so big fat books. When you, when you open the middle, there's one here and one there. He does double one, so one one way, one the other. It's incredible. And he's not expensive. I don't think. Give you a nice edge for 300 quid. Now and again, we get little commissions that are funny. And this was a book 
I got in when I worked here in, uh, very early on at Taurus Bookbindery in Berkeley, and this is a Victorian uh, thing that came in for repair, and I had to completely dismantle it. So I thought, while I've got it apart, I'll copy it. And I did. And then Games of Berkeley bought 12 of them. And these are, these are 19th century things. Sometimes they had chess on the outside and backgammon on the inside. Anyway, I made 12 of them for Games of Berkeley, delivered them all, and a year later got them all back because none of them sold. <laughs> so that taught me not to indulge in that kind of commerce anymore. Um, I just gave them away to friends in the end. But one of the nice things about like, um, structure serving function is this. As it turns out, when you make that thing, it opens here, it hinges here. Because of the way you have to hinge it, when it opens, it gives you the bar to put your counters on. You know, it wasn't, that didn't come about by design. That's just how it happened, which is rather nice. And then my brother got married, and he called me, and he said, I've got a much better record collection than he has, and, or did then. And he said, will you do um, uh, an album for my wedding and I said how big do you want it how many photographs do you want and he said no I don't mean that I mean an album like a mixtape and that set me thinking isn't it funny they're, they're both called albums so I made this it's called a wedding album but it c contains the music for his wedding now that you might look at that and think gosh that must have been a long time ago because it's a tape it wasn't actually that long ago it's just that I still use tapes and he had to get a, a tape recorder in in order to play it. That's his fault for getting rid of his hi-fi system. And this is called a coffin book by some of us. And of course, it goes back centuries. Be before there were banks and before pe people couldn't afford safes, you would literally excavate one of your books and hide your stuff. And, and I don't know, I read a novel once, and it might have been by Jane Austen or it might have been by somebody else. And I, for the life of me, I can't remember who, but somebody one day will tell me, where one day they spent a happy afternoon cutting out holes from a book to hide their jewellery. And then, so you cut them out, and then you get some household paste, and you just paste the pages together, and that's your secret space. Except, of course, then you can't remember which book you put it in, and uh, you've got a huge search uh, to get it. Moving on to a, a few more, uh, moving more now to current working book artists. This is Claire Van Vliet's book. Aunt Sally's Lament, and it's beautiful. This is not the original, which was very expensive. This is the, the more affordable one that was done by Chronicle Books very beautifully about 15 years ago. What I love about this is an example of, again, of, of uh, structure serving form or content because the book is simply hinged, and as you turn each page, it reveals some text of the poem while concealing some that went before it. So that if you go, every time you turn the page, you go back to the beginning and read everything that's there, it changes the poem in slightly different ways. And I think it's a genius idea. And her work has uh, just been here at the centre, um, her 60th anniversary of her press, which is pretty extraordinary. When we were in New Zealand in, November, in October, we walked into the first visit, and there it was again, an exhibition of Claire Van Viet's work. So she's having a marvellous time. And this is great that we have Chronicle Books who will, do, will take great work and reproduce it, I think, f pretty faithfully. So I go to the London Artist Book Fair, and this is where I collect stuff that's inexpensive and charming. And there's a lot of stuff coming out of Japan and Korea that's, you know, just beautiful. This is by uh, Katsumi Komogata from 1990, so it's quite old now. I bought it a couple of years ago, and it's called Play With Colors, and it's for kids. But she said, when, I, when, she, when she sold it to me, she said, no kids. I said, I understand, no kids. Because <laughs> she'd gone through all this pain. Make, but it's beautiful, because look what it does. It's, got, it's a, it's a three-fold, and it just does that and that. And then... It's beautiful. And also by her, Walk and Look, which is... Another form of visual deceptiveness, it's just an accordion fold. It couldn't be simpler. We should all be making these at home. This is called Tiger Zebra. This is called Wolf Lamb. Oh, dear. And this is called Day and Night. Apologies to Mr. Kellogg, presumably, for that. But it's absolutely beautiful. And then this is by our very own Dorothy Yule, 
whose work I've admired for years and years and years, and again, simply couldn't afford one. And when we left these shores to go to England, Dorothy walked round to our house because we were neighbours and she gave me a copy of this and I didn't know what to do because it was such a wonderful thing to happen. And, you know, if you know Dorothy's work, it's a labour of love. She can work for many, many years on her stuff. She writes the stuff. She does the illustrations. Sometimes her sister Susan helps her with the illustrations. And then there's the poetry and then she hand sets everything and then she prints it and then she colours it and then she binds it. And it's incredible. And who can argue that those are the four great cities of the world? And there are these charming pop-ups. They're actually concertinas with pop-ups inside them. I think the poems are by her sister Susan. And they're absolutely gorgeous. That's the London one. I think that must be the Albert Hall. There's a London bus. That's them all nicely arranged. And there's a close-up of Manhattan. And here the strangest thing happened. So, the day came as every book artist... Uh, longs for when you get the call from Chronicle. Easy for Dorothy, she works there. But anyway, <laughs> somebody from the office upstairs called Dorothy and said, um, would like to reproduce your San Francisco book for San Francisco. So I think it was $450 for the set, which was, you know, 15 years ago. So they'll reproduce this one and it'll sell for $5. And it's beautiful. So she got to go to the... Uh, the uh, factory in Japan and oversee it all, uh, not in Japan, sorry, in China, to make sure A, it's a good factory, and B, that they're doing it right. So, and then that all happened, but I didn't know anything about it. And we were leaving to go home after the summer, and I saw it at the airport at the, at the, at the till, $5. So I bought one, got it home, opened it up, and it was really weird. It had handwriting all over it in Chinese and in English, and one arrow said crease, the other one said indent, the other one said para. So I thought nothing about it, came back, told Dorothy about it. I think I brought it to show it to her, and she said, this is my proof copy from the factory. Okay, that's her handwriting. So it's, she's, not only has it got into the food chain, I bought it. That is the most Willy Wonka-ish thing that could ever happen to anyone. It's weirder than, weirder than Wonka. Back to London and then back to Japan. This is a beautiful book by Kaho Kojima called Warmth. And she'd just seen that film about the penguins. And this is a, a carousel book. Um, you know, we think of Heidi Kyle when we think of carousel books. But actually, Heidi, it's important to remember, Heidi says, I invented nothing. I just observed and copied and innovated and changed. But we still think Heidi's a god. However... This is a carousel book, and it's all hand-cut because this is her student graduating piece, and they don't use die-cut when they're at college in Japan. <coughs> this is the most trivial book I own, and it's also one of my favorite. We were teaching in Pocatello, Idaho, and while I was teaching, Michael went out to get some lunch and brought this back, and I sent him immediately out to buy all of them in the store. There are about 50 of them. So it's called Shocking Books, and that's a little slipcase, and inside, you know, <laughs> sex secrets revealed by... Dr. I love freely. <laughs> We're in Mormon territory here, you have to understand. Now, what's really interesting is, I think this cost 50 cents, and we bought 30 or 40 of them. The cover is made of aluminum foil, and inside there's a little battery, a little circuit board, so when you open it, you get a little electric shock. <laughs> As I say, it's trivial, but, you know, it appeals to me. Another one of my favorites, um, this is by, also by Ka Kaho Kojima, and it's beautiful. It's called Have a Good Day, and you open it up, and it's a diorama of a kitchen with three busy chefs. Everything pops up. But what's really good, so he's making a pizza, he's frying some eggs, and he's making a cake. What's really great is that these are three little flip books that show them doing those activities. And there's a surprise at the end of each one. Like the cake, for instance, changes and turns into a flock of birds and flies away. It's absolutely beautiful. She made five for her graduation. This is the last one left. And I bought it. And it was 50 pounds. And I said, you need to put your prices up. Well, she has, because now she teaches. And her stuff goes for many hundreds. But it's absolutely amazing. Also at the... London Artist Book Fair, I bought this. This is by Joan Beadle, who actually teaches book arts in Manchester. 
uh, on, a, on the course there. And it, um, okay, so Claire Van Vliet, years ago when we went to see her, I've only seen her demonstrate once at the Guild of Book Workers Conference, and she said, when I've done with the project, I give it a mark out of 100. And the highest I've ever given myself is 90%. And I thought, she is tough on herself. Now, I give my, these books marks. This one is the only book I think I own that I think is, has achieved perfection. It's called Shirt Book, and it was written during the year when she was going through a very unpleasant divorce. So it's a shirt box, and inside there's a shirt, but it's not a shirt, of course. It's a printing of a shirt. But it's in the nice cellophane, held together with the, she sourced all this stuff with the proper ribbon and the little pin. And it's a concertina book that stands about this high. And the pages are uh, printed somehow. And then the text is on paper that's been uh, wetted and crumpled and ironed so the creases stay in it. And the poem is written on the joined um, accordion folded creases. And the poem says, Ironing your shirt, I realized how it is possible to make things look like they are together when actually they have totally fallen apart. I thought it was terribly moving. And on the back, there's this shape. And I said, is that printed too? She said, no, I just held the iron there <laughs> until it burned right through the paper. But it's superb. And again, it was £30. You know, it's just crazy. And it's my most uh, treasured thing, in a sense. And then for £8, I bought this. This is um, Jong Il Sha, who is from South Korea. And they come over from Korea and from Japan to the book fairs in England, paid, by, paid for by their colleges, to have a stand and to be professional. And it's wonderful. And this, when I saw this, the reason I bought this is I've been book burning for a long time and I never, ever thought that you could do this. She's printed her book, she's drilled a hole in it, and she's threaded a piece of string through, and that's all she's done. And it's so terribly clever. There's about ten in here. That's my favorite, opening a church fate. It's just brilliant. And in the little envelope you get, you get with it, you get a spare piece of string, and it says, uh, it says something like, now you have a go, or something. It's really, really sweet. Now, I think you all know Damien Hirst, don't you? He's internationally well-known. Love him or hate him, it's hard not to hate him. Uh, sometimes. Some of his stuff is good. But when he was covering minis in dots, I got a little bit bored. And, you know, he's got a Warholian kind of factory, and that's all fine. But these people, Foundry Press in Bristol, decided they'd have a bit of fun. So they got this blank book, and they've called it Damien, uh, sorry, generic Damien Hirst. And it's great, because inside, you get comes with a book of stickers. <laughs> and it just, I think it says inside, you too can be a great artist. <laughs> well, they got sued by Damien Hirst. Well, they didn't get sued. They got a cease and desist letter. And I just thought, that is so pathetic. He should be thrilled. He's got 900 trillion pounds anyway. But anyway, no, he got a little bit shirty about it, as we say. And so they, they, they took umbrage. But they consulted a lawyer, and it they, they, turns out they were, they were fine. They didn't have to cease and desist. They just had to bend the rules. So I sold them the next year, and this is volume two. I said, how's it going with Damien? He said, it's going great. Look what we've done. <laughs> you rearrange the letters of his name, you get generic named shirty. <laughs> and he can't sue them anymore. <laughs> and inside, in the back, you get a copy of the facts from the lawyers. The cease and desist letter, which is also really great. Now, do you remember years ago, late 90s, these cows started to appear everywhere. I first saw them in Chicago. We were driving down the street and I said, there's a cow halfway up that skyscraper. And it was these big fiberglass cows, you know, the artist painting. I think, did they make it here? Yes. Yes. They were everywhere. They even made it to England. Anyway, then we had our exchange show. Handbook Binders of California and the Chicago Handbook Binders. I think it was, I want to say it was like 99, something like that. And I remember it because Brewster had a new thing, which was called something like a, a phone, some kind of video phone thing that nobody had ever heard of. No, the kind we've all now got. So we had this sort of live link up that didn't really work very well. It went up, up, up. 
So they had their opening in Chicago, and we had ours here. And we, in other words, our show opened there, and their show opened here. It was fabulous. So I thought, well, I'm going to do a book about San Francisco and Chicago, me, you know, referencing the cows that we've just seen. So my book is called San Francisco Cow, Chicago Cow. And it's about a cow that goes from San Francisco to Chicago. Um, finding the cow print was the hardest. I got a little hoof print made. And it's covered in cowhide, of course, and stamped with black and white lettering. And this is just the journey that the cow might make between the two cities. So he goes, of course, across, across California, Nevada, Mutar, Colorado, Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois. That's about uh, as many puns as anyone can take. <laughs> and on the back, there's a cowlophon. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> and it's for sale, Tom, this book. And then the other silly thing that I did, because my, my work is so serious, you know, working on restoring books, that having fun is great. So Linda Barrett, who, funnily enough, is from Chicago and now lives there again, she organized a St. Patrick's Day thing at the center of the book. We are famous for our St. Patrick's Day events. And she'd found at her, sh her store, Kozo Arts, down on Union Street there, this huge roll of horrible, it was green velveteen, this horrible material. So everybody was given a meter of it, or a yard probably, and said, uh, do something with it. So I thought, well, it looks a bit like fake grass, and it looks a bit like the inside of... I didn't know what it's called, but it turns out it's called a cantina, where you keep your, your family silver. Well, how, how can I combine the two? So, this book is called Putting the Green in Green Velveteen, as in we put the green in green velveteen, but it's also a pun, because it also says, it also means putting the green. It's by Cyril O'Dimion, that's my book artist's name, because that's an anagram of my name. And it's a traditional book with edge gilding and everything, and then you open it up, and there's your putting cup. And in here there's a roller blind, which is about 15 foot long, and it stretches out. And there's the golf club sawn in half. And there are balls. So t a guy called Tom Ingalls, who I think at the time was, were you freelancing for Schwing magazine? Yeah. He saw it and said, you want to be in my magazine? It's called Schwing. What is that? It's a sort of punk golf magazine. I said, that sounds good. So he got me into Schwing. And that's Tom operating it. And then the guy called me from some company somewhere and said, we're interested in your product. Can you tell me what the unit cost is? And I said, yes, the unit cost is $2,000. He said, how many are there? I said, there's one. <laughs> there's one unit. Have you thought about having them manufactured in China? I said, no, and put the phone down. <laughs> and then about four years ago, I was at the PCBA show here. It's not every year now, is it the PCBA? Is it every couple of years or every three years maybe? Three years. Every three years. Oh, it's coming up. Thank you. And I just saw some stuff, and it reminded me why this place is so important for book arts and book binding and printing and everything else. And I saw a number of things I really wanted to document, but this is the first one I saw. And this is, I have to read this now, because not only can I not remember it all, the artist is in the room, and I know I'm going to get it wrong. This is Halfway Down the Moon, The Fears and Dreams of Arthur Pupov by Saul Rosenfeld, who's sitting over there somewhere. Where are you, Saul? There he is. So Saul trained as an architect and worked as a builder and a furniture maker and a graphic designer. You'll see why when you, when you get to see it all. It's beautifully made out of wood and paper and type, and it all folds up into this gorgeous box. And he, here he's got several different kinds of books, some accordions, some codexes with these lovely twirling um, cubes of letters on them. And that's it with all its stuff packed into the box. And here's the scroll, and this is the poem, which you may remember, halfway down. Halfway down the stairs is a stair where I sit. There isn't any other stair quite like it. I'm not at the bottom. I'm not at the top. So this is the stair where I always stop. <laughs> and I asked Saul, I don't understand the marks on the front. And he said, well, that's to show you where to place the things when it goes on exhibition. And I thought, that's the architect in him. And it's absolutely beautiful. And that's the most beautiful part, which is the acrylic. I guess it's acrylic, is it? That you've, you've, and you've just abraded it. It's beautiful. That's the moon. Aww. And there's the tower, and there's halfway down the stair. Wow. So you don't have to be a bookbinder to make books. You can be a carpenter, you can be an architect, you can be a designer, you can be a musician. It doesn't matter. You can do anything and call it a book. 
as long as it has text on it. And it doesn't even have to have text on it. It can be blank. In fact, anything can be a book, except the Rosetta Stone, because I draw the line there. I think a book needs to be portable. <laughs> Don't you think? You should be able to carry it around with you. And this is a personal favourite, and this is Lisa Rappaport, of course, from Oakland, Littoral Press. And this is called The Short Goodbye, and I have to read this too, and it's such a funny, clever idea. In a dark alley, Philip Marlowe runs into concrete poetry. The Short Goodbye is a short, found book by Lisa Rappaport. Each sentence in it was borrowed from Raymond Chandler's The Long Goodbye. Quotes about coffee, whiskey, guns, lips, eyes, sex, and gimlets have been formulated into thematic, typographic shapes. In other words, she's taken every reference in The Long Goodbye about coffee, and she's put them all together in one long paragraph and printed them in the shape of a coffee cup, because you can do what you like with letterpress printing, or with this, this is probably, a, I don't know if it's a pollen plate or whether she set it, but also, of course, because printers mix their own ink, she can have steam coming off in a, slight, in a pale brown colour, and it's beautiful. The, the boards are covered in this metal, and then her friend plugged the whole thing with a 9mm pistol, because uh, <laughs> being a sensible woman, she doesn't own a gun, but she obviously knows somebody who does. And then the covers are a kind of louvre thing, you know, obviously hinting at the noir movies. And I said, God, where did you get them? She said, you know, Home Depot. <laughs> Just cut them down. It's absolutely beautiful. And then this is the, the, the book I just added yesterday because I saw it for the first time uh, recently at the centre for the book. And it's extraordinary. It's called Paper Space. And this was part of the, um, uh, what's the series called? The imprint. The imprint series at the centre of the book by Kota Ozawa. So this is the structure seen from above. So it's a four-fold diorama, basically. And Ozawa is a film, video, and photography archaeologist. And I had to look him up to find out what that means. He searches through old films, or moments even, in history, and then recasts them with his extraordinary artwork, and in this case, a book of paper cuts. And the point of doing this is he's interested in these film, TV, whatever moments that discuss America's relationship with itself. So when we come down, we see it's, it's, it's in layers, rather like a theatre book, but it's not enclosed, it's open. And the four scenes he's dis decided to de depict are that one, which is the Ford Theatre in 1865, Dallas, 23rd of November 1963. I think it's quite moving. When you look at it, you don't really know what it is, and then you see that. The pink suit, the pink suit. yeah. And then this, weirdly, that is O.J. Simpson awaiting the verdict of his trial in 1985 with, that's Johnny Cochran. I don't know who the other one is. Somebody might know. Is that Kardashian? Oh, well, that's good. And this one, I knew all about this one. This is the Malice in the Palace, the famous brawl at Orbit. Uh, I, I had never heard of it. That's why I'm reading it out. I'm joking. <laughs> never heard of it. <clears throat> Involving the players in the Indiana Pacers and the Detroit Pistons and fans of the 2003 game, Ron Artest, later known as Meta World Peace. Is this all possibly true? Yeah. My friend Matthew just told me last night at dinner. And later still, oh, he was one of the most notable players to go and play in the UK. I didn't even know that. Anyway, and Steve Jackson, who later played for the Warriors, of course. Everybody knows that. <laughs> anyway. But I was speaking to Brian Lesky, who said he helped on the construction of this, and he spent many days cutting out these tiny little pieces of paper and putting them in for the eyes. And if you got them in slightly the wrong place, they totally changed the expression of the faces, which is really interesting, particularly that first one of the Ford Theatre. Another Dorothy Yule piece here. Now, Dorothy and Jim got married, but I don't know, oh, well, it says there, I was going to say five or six years ago, five years ago. And they got married a little later in life, and they wanted to do something of significance as a gift to give to all their guests. And this is what they gave us. It's called Dorothy and Jim in a Nutshell. Jim made the nutshell. He cut all the nuts in half. 
uh, Dorothy did everything else. You know, it's tiny. It's handset type. It's letterpress printed. It's hand colored. And it's got photographs of them from childhood to now. And it's absolutely exquisite. And this is what it says. Before we ever met, the threads of fate were weaving possibility and chance into the separate fabrics of our lives that one day we might fall in love and dance. Dark yarns of sorrow spin with shiny joy the ambiguity of every heart. The tight-strung warp of family and friends is loomed with weft of passion, hope and art. May gratitude become the seam that joins each of us to the other in this life, and may the richest tapestry unfold as we grow older now as man and wife. Mm. And her latest book is this. She's been working on this book for nearly 20 years. It's called Memories of Science. Dorothy had, when she was young, a fascination with all sciences, and she was very good at them all. And then she gave it all up for art. And this is what the book is about. So it's got chapters on astronomy, electromagnetism, on bugs and butterflies and biology and everything. So it's in this box. And here's a little CD, which you can still play if you have a CD player. The CD, I was contemplating showing you this but it it would be it would take too long the cd contains the song sung written and sung by her brother doug yule who was the who was in the velvet underground and uh it, so that the the script of the the uh, of the book are the lyrics of the song and my cousin ed who's a filmmaker has made a short animated film about the making of the book set to that music it's a whole fabulous celebration but if you go to uh, Dorothy Yule, Memories of Science, you'll see the six-minute video with the song and her making the book. You can see that in your own time. But it's absolutely incredible because her pop-ups are stunning. And this is chemistry. Oh, and also they are interactive, not interactive, but they're, they're moving pop-ups. When you open them, um, things underneath are caused to move by you opening the pages, so things swirl and change and everything. So when you open this, the butterflies are flat, and then they come out, and then they do this as they come to rest. It's incredible. Same with this. As you open this, this is magnetism. The, the other one was bugs. This is magnetism. This swirls round, ends up pointing to magnetic north, and these things start fluttering with the, you know, the electric shock things. It's incredible. And... That's astronomy. So when you open this, the moon is hidden, and you turn the page, he reveals his face. And when you open this, the flaps open to reveal the pig's heart. Because it was about dissecting a pig's heart in this poem. Um, I don't know how big the edition is. Um, it was on exhibition last year. Um, it's, it's just arrived in the world after many years. And I'm going to end with this, because of all the books that I... I don't own this book. I wish I did. But of all the books that I've seen in recent years, this is the one, more than anything, that stopped my heart when I saw it. It was at the PCBA show a few years ago. And I saw it across the room, and I thought, oh, I don't have much time. I won't look at that. It looks a little bit feminine for me. It'll be something to do with dressmaking. I'm not going to go and look at it. And then I did go and look at it. So it's an Edwardian lady. And the only text on it is this. And I'll read it in case you can't read it from there. $75, 18 of 146, Ida Brodsky, 1895 to 1911, Triangle Factory, New York, New York. And I knew what that meant. I have to explain it to people in England because they don't know, but this is the case that began the process of health and safety at work. The 146 women died because they were locked in because there were no fire escapes, and most of them jumped to their deaths. And $75 was the compensation paid to the family. I see from my clock that we're out of time. So thank you very much for having me.